In 1934, the Soviet Union joined the League of Nations. Again and again before the League, its representatives urged binding agreements to support by collective action any nation submitted to attack. The state I represent entered the League with the sole purpose of the maintenance of indivisible peace. The League of Nations is still strong enough by its collective actions to avert or arrest aggression. There is no room for bargaining or compromise. Calvin Coolidge. I, Herbert Clark Hoover. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will face... Five men sat in the White House between 1919 and 1933. Two were great, two were average, and one was a bad president. And the greatest of these was the most hated. The fact that he was also for a time the most beloved man on earth made the tragedy of Thomas Woodrow Wilson even greater. The world must be made safe for democracy. And when Wilson went to Europe the first time, the world's heartbeat was with him. In France, they lighted candles in his honor. He was cheered as no conqueror ever was. In Rome, his picture hung in almost every home. His was a glory far exceeding Caesar's. In England, his path from the Channel Coast to Charing Cross Station was strewn with flowers. This, indeed, was a man of peace. But less than a year later, the man of peace was a mere man of politics. He had made two trips to Europe and spent six months at that green baize table with Clemenceau, Orlando, and Lloyd George. He had laid his 14 points containing his league before them and to keep his dream alive had been forced to compromise and conciliate barter and bargain to such an extent that the product he brought home for approval was already suffering from the anemia which was the old world's chronic disease. Gentlemen of the Senate, the Treaty of Peace with Germany was signed at Versailles on the 28th of June. <coughs> I avail myself of the earliest possible opportunity to lay the treaty before you for ratification. My brothers, the stage is set. The destiny disclosed. We cannot turn back. America shall in truth show the way. He had been back less than 30 days when he realized that he was losing his battle, that his moment was slipping away from him. Although a majority of the American voters and most newspapers favored the League, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge had marshaled sufficient forces of jingoism to kill it. So, for the first time in a non-election year, an American president boarded a train and took his fight to the people. I have not come here to debate this treaty. It speaks for itself, if you will let it. I am going to expound it, to urge you, here in Columbus, to assert the spirit of the American people in support of it. Do not let men pull it down. And the opposition followed him across the country. Senator William Borah in Chicago. It took George Washington seven years to gain independence from George III. And now, my friends, they want to give it back to George V. The president made as many as five and six speeches a day, but he was smiling less now. I can predict with absolute certainty that within another generation there will be another world war. If the nations of the world do not concert this method 
by which to prevent it. The crowd roared, impeach Wilson, as Hiram Johnson shouted, He is asking us to hand American destiny over to the secret councils of Europe. It is the duty of the senators of this nation to keep America American. Wilson was picking up momentum. He had whipped Johnson in his own California. In Salt Lake City, his ovation was thunderous. But that night, the president left without visiting the livestock exhibition. He boarded the train for Wichita, but the Presidential Limited never stopped in Kansas. With shades drawn, halting only to change engines, it hurtled on to Washington. There, a few days later, he suffered an apoplectic stroke. Now he was dying. On March 19th, the Senate dealt the treaty and the League the final death blow. The vote was 15 short of the needed two-thirds majority, with many Wilson supporters voting against the watered-down version. The nation was almost without a president now. The gates of the White House remained closed, the windows dark. The customary flow of visitors dwindled to an occasional pilgrimage by an old friend. His kingdom, his power, and his glory were gone. now apparent that the Republican ticket of Harding and Coolidge is running well ahead of Cox and Roosevelt. At the present time, Harding has collected more than 16 million votes against some 9 million for the Democrats. We'll give you the state vote in just a moment. But first, we'd like to ask you to let us know if this broadcast is reaching you. Please drop us a card, address station KDKA, Westinghouse, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The White House is a kind of alchemist. There, little men have grown great, and great men have become giants. Warren Harding entered armed with the love and devotion of an adoring public. But the White House took this mediocre man, found his weaknesses, overwhelmed him, and broke him. His ordeal, which lasted 27 months, transformed a full-throated optimist into a faltering cynic. Listen to the process as it took place. Harding, just before his inauguration... I like to go out to the country and bloviate. What is the greatest thing in life? Happiness. And there is more happiness in the American village than any place on earth. The president, six months later. You know, before I was elected, I thought the chief pleasure of being president would be to give honors and office to my old friends. But you know... You can't do that when you are president. You have to get the best man. Harding, after one year. The White House is a prison. I can't get away from men who dog my footsteps. I'm in jail. Harding, after 18 months. I am a man of limited talents from a small town. I, I don't seem to grasp the fact that I'm president. After 26 months. In this job, I'm not worried about my enemies. It's my friends who are giving me trouble. On July 24, 1923, the late afternoon paper showed that Rogers Hornsby was leading the National League with 399, and that Anaconda Copper had closed at 42 and a quarter. The president was resting comfortably at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco after an attack of indigestion. And Calvin Coolidge, in the most anonymous job in the world, was fishing in Vermont. At 7.30, Harding's secretary, George Christian, was standing before a large audience in Los Angeles, reading the speech the president had been scheduled to make that night. <clears throat> the president continues. I am a confirmed optimist as to the growth of the spirit of brotherhood. We do rise to heights at times when we look for the good rather than the evil in others. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you must excuse uh, President Harding. The president is dead. In the East, the radio stations and theaters had been closed down for hours. As the bell of the Congregational Church in Plymouth, Vermont, tolls the hour, 
An oil lamp flickers on in the small white cottage of John Coolidge, a justice of the peace. While most of the nation sleeps, eight people witness the inauguration of the 28th president. Raise your right hand. <coughs> Do you, Calvin Coolidge, solemnly swear I, Calvin Coolidge, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute <coughs> the we office. We awoke the of next the morning to read the, the black States headlines and, and plunge into national grief. But slowly the wheels of our democracy began to reveal what Harding had discovered in his last two months in office. This committee intends to pursue further the story of Teapot Dome. In his desire to be loved, Harding had experimented in government by friendship, and his friends had robbed him of his name and destroyed all will except the one to die. Charles Forbes, Harding's court jester in charge of veterans' affairs, went to Leavenworth after squandering $200 million of the taxpayers' money. Such was the legacy that Harding passed on to Calvin Coolidge. Fortunately for the nation, Charles Evans Hughes and Herbert Hoover agreed to stay on in the cabinet. Alabama has 24 votes for Oscar W. Underwood. By 1924, there were two and a half million radio sets. And that summer, Americans heard their first political conventions. My fellow countrymen, the business of America is business. And business was good in America. Coolidge, beginning his first full term in office, was the undisputed high priest of prosperity. He was calm, cool, and silent. The people were hot, hyperthyroid, and roaring. Collegiate, collegiate, yes, we are collegiate. Nothing intermediate, no man trousers. Skirts were now 20 inches above the ground, almost at the knee. Employment and stocks were still rising, but nowhere near the peak. It was 1925. The automobile was changing the face of the nation, and our voice was changing, too. Day by day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Bridge gave way to the Kuei system, which gave way to Mahjong. East wind, one crack, three bends. Mahjong! Oh. Oh, I have... Which gave way to the crossword. Mug, I need a ten-letter word meaning to expedite. Last letter is E. Here they come again, the Clico Club Eskimos. Blow some my way. Four out of five have it. Remember, your future is in Florida, the fair white goddess of states. The Charleston craze, the black bottom, the flapper, the raccoon coat, an entire lexicon of new words. Oh yeah? Says you. Lousy, Freud, Izzy and Moe, the million dollar baby, breach of promise. A revolution in music. Gershwin, Berlin, Handy, Beiderbeck, Whiteman, and the golden age of sports. Here he is in the motion. There's the wind-up. Here's the pitch. It's a slow curve low, and the babe swings. It's a long one, a long one going out toward right center. Stengel is backing up against the wall. He can't get it. It's in there. Another home run for the Bambino. So the babe hits his second homer of the day. Outlined against the blue-gray October sky... The four horsemen rode again. That's Grantland Rice. In dramatic lore, they are known as famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. And in country stores and speakeasies, Americans argued about payment of the war debts. President Coolidge said, They hired the money, didn't they? Let them pay it. I don't propose to make merchandise out of American principles. But while the favor of America is not for sale... I am willing to make concessions for a chance to do a little profitable economic and moral rescuing. 